Hi, my name is Mike Woodruff. We have an opportunity coming up. All the Christians, all the different churches coming together to celebrate those that are stepping forward to publicly identify with Jesus Christ in baptism. This is going to be a great service, March 10th, 7 o'clock. I heard from lots of people, people that have been at Christ Church for 20 years, 30 years, that this was their favorite service ever. If you missed it, you missed it. You don't want to miss it again. If you have not been baptized, let me say again, as I've said so many times, there's not really a category for a Christ follower who hasn't stepped forward and publicly identified with Jesus Christ in baptism. Let's get it done this year. This is a wonderful opportunity you don't want to miss. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 32 through 37. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. It's a truth universally acknowledged that a college student at home on spring break must be in need of a nap. To sleep, perchance through the night. Birds do it, bees do it, beluga whales do it, Americans, not so much. Data indicate that most of us are sleep deprived. We're wired in workaholics. Forty percent of us, apparently, are getting less than six hours of sleep a night. Back in 1910, people slept an average of nine hours a night. No wonder, then, that the quest for a good night's sleep has become a cultural obsession and big business. Consumers spent more than $40 billion on sleep-related products in 2015. So in light of our insomniac times, what was Jesus thinking? What do we make of His teaching? To stay awake, to keep watch at all hours of the night. Well, Jesus' words are as important and as radical for us today as they were for the first disciples. What I'd like you to see is how easy it is for us to go through life dreaming with our eyes wide open, asleep at the wheel of our own life story. And Jesus in our text issues a proverbial wake-up call, a demand to become alert and attentive to the real world, not the world of stock markets or stockpiled nuclear weapons, but the world where God is actively at work bringing all things in heaven and on earth under the headship of Jesus Christ. Let's take it one verse at a time, starting with Jesus' command in verse 33, be on guard, be alert. If you want to be a follower of Jesus and not simply an admirer of Jesus, you have to hear and do what He says. This is the cost of discipleship. To cite the title of a famous book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian who paid the ultimate cost of discipleship by being martyred in the uh, Nazi Germany regime for his faith. To be a disciple, Bonhoeffer knew, is to commit to living a certain way. And by the way, that, that was the first name for Christians. We read in Acts 9-2 that Christians were called those who belonged to the way. You see, it's not about being a good person. Jesus' way isn't simply a way of morality. It's about living out His life in us through faith by the power of His Spirit. All of us are somebody's disciples. We're all following somebody's words, somebody's wisdom, 
For example, we all have ideas about love because we've heard somebody say something about love. We may have heard it in a film, like Love Story, where one of the characters says, love means never having to say you're sorry. Or you may have heard it in a song by the Beatles, all you need is love. Or Justin Bieber, love yourself. Or maybe we got our notion from a more respectable source like Albert Einstein, who said, you can't blame gravity for falling in love. Or a novelist like James Joyce, who said, love loves to love love. Well, the Bible tells us God is love, 1 John 4, 8, and the other John 3.16, the one that's not in the end zone, uh, 1 John 3.16, says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. So if you want to know whose disciple you are, look at the way you think about and express love. Now, some people think that God's love means that He's in the business of forgiveness so that He'll love us no matter what. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer, whom I just mentioned, calls this idea cheap grace. It's the preaching of forgiveness without the practice of discipleship. And cheap grace is only a half truth, a half gospel, because the full gospel is that Jesus Yes, He died for our sins, but that isn't all. He rose again so that we would have new life and freedom and fellowship with God and one another. And He sent His Spirit into the church so that those who believe in Him will have the Spirit's life in them. So that Paul can say in Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. The key to a flourishing life is finding out what truly matters and then making that the center of your life. We know what mattered to Jesus. He came proclaiming the kingdom of God. Those who would follow after Jesus must, must make His main thing their main thing. And the kingdom of God is not one more thing on the disciples' to-do list. It's rather the one thing that puts every other thing into its proper place. To seek the kingdom is to let Christ our King rule over everything we happen to be doing. Now the context for Jesus' command to be alert is His teaching about the coming day of the Lord. In verse 32 He says, no one knows that day or hour. And it's precisely because we don't know when Jesus will return to usher in the final phase of God's kingdom that we have to stay alert. Now, let me introduce here one technical theological term, eschatology, from the Greek term eschatos, which means last. Eschatology is the study of last things. You've probably heard people discussing end times or suggesting timetables for the end of the world. Well, the point that Jesus is making is not that we should be trying to figure out when Jesus is coming back. We've been there, done that countless times, and every time we try it, it ends with an embarrassed miscalculation. Jesus' point is that we should be ready whenever. Christians aren't the only ones speculating about end times, though. Everyone's talking about the apocalypse these days. In fact, just this month, I saw on a roadside billboard near my home a uh, survivalist expo that's taking place here in Lake County this month. Here's their tagline. If you've thought about what it means to prepare for the worst, the Chicagoland Survival Expo is for you. Long-term food storage, tactical gear, and so much more will be available for purchase. Well. Is stockpiling supplies or building underground bunkers what Jesus had in mind when He told His disciples to be alert and to stay uh, on guard? No. Jesus' followers should be preparing not for doomsday, but for the day of the Lord. It's a good apocalypse. So eschatology, last things, begins now. 
Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. So, we are living between the times. We're living between the end time, resurrection time, which has already started but hasn't yet come to completion. That's the context of Jesus' charge to stay alert. It's about eschatological discipleship, about knowing how to follow Jesus between the times, in our present time, which is poised between His first resurrection and His second coming. Now, Jesus tells a short, very short story in verses 34 to 36 that's all about eschatological discipleship. It begins when He says, it's like a man who goes away. It's a parable of the kingdom. It's unique to Mark's gospel, and it's a story about the need for wakefulness in the master's absence. But just before we look at the story, let me address a question you may have already thought of, and that is, how literally are we to take this? Because on a surface reading, the cost of discipleship seems to be never getting a good night's sleep. (laughs) Well, we need to take Jesus' teaching with the utmost seriousness, but we need to read it as He intended it, and not literalistically. We know from elsewhere in the New Testament that sleep is a metaphor for spiritual dullness or inattentiveness. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians that disciples are children of the day, and then he adds, so let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert. Now, of course, we need a good night's sleep in order to be alert during the day, Don't take my word for it. You can read the New York Times bestseller, Why We Sleep, by the director of the Center for Human Sleep Science at UC Berkeley. There's a biological drive, you see, that the Creator put in us, in fact, in every living thing that He made, a drive to sleep. In fact, humanity is the only species that deliberately deprives itself of sleep. So much so that the World Health Organization has declared a sleep loss epidemic in industrialized nations. Scientists have stayed awake trying to figure out why we sleep. We can't gather food or make money or look for a mate while we sleep, so what purpose does it serve our species? Some said it's a kind of biological appendix. It's there, but we don't know why. But new research has shown that sleep enhances every organ in our body and that it may be the single most effective thing you can do to rest your brain and your body each day. Now, some people suffer from narcolepsy. It's an autoimmune illness that disrupts normal speech patterns. I have a friend, a theologian named Oliver Crisp, whose daughter was the youngest child ever diagnosed with narcolepsy. And you can read about the family's heartbreaking coping with her illness in a book that uh, his wife wrote called Waking Matilda. All this to say, Jesus is not speaking literally about sleep. Jesus is not anti-sleep. He's speaking about being alert at all times to the coming kingdom of God. And in his story, Jesus compares himself to the man going on a journey because Jesus soon will be leaving His disciples. In the words of the creed, you see, after Jesus' death and resurrection, He ascended into heaven. In the meantime, He's assigning tasks to His followers. The true disciple, like the faithful servant, is actively engaged in serving the Master. Verse 35, therefore stay awake for you do not know when the master of the house will come." The house the servants are looking after is probably the church. The New Testament often speaks about the church as a house or a household of God. But as we can see by the end of the passage, Jesus is talking not simply to church leaders, but to all disciples. He wants us to remain vigilant, alert, and attentive. When I taught at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, one of my responsibilities was to invigilate, 
But when they told me that, I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> to invigilate, it's a technical term, means to supervise students when they're taking final exams. I had to remain vigilant, alert to the possibility that they might be cheating. I think Jesus in this story is asking disciples to invigilate their Christian lives, to keep watch over the way they live so that they would not fall into temptation or stray from the way. You know, in verse 35, Mark makes a special point of referring to all hours of the night. He says, whether in the evening, which is our 6 to 9 p.m., or midnight, 9 to midnight, when the rooster crows, 12 to 3 a.m., and in the morning, 3 to 6 a.m. He's making a special point that at all hours, at all times, disciples must keep watch. He uses the same Greek term for keep watch, which many versions translate stay awake. He uses it in verses 34, 35, and 37. The Greek verb is gregoreo. It means keep awake. But did you know that the name Gregory is derived from this Greek verb, gregoreo? You can sort of hear how they sound the same. And did you know that this is why there are so many saints and even a few popes named Gregory? The name Gregory reminds us that true disciples of Jesus are the kind of people who remain spiritually alert. This whole parable is a lesson on the importance of spiritual alertness between the times of Jesus' first and second coming. But our whole lifetime is between these times, and that means the parable is a reminder that each day in our life is a potential time of trial where we will show ourselves either to be faithful or unfaithful servant followers. The cost of drowsy discipleship, of failing to be alert, is spelled out in verse 36. Do not let him find you sleeping. You've all heard the expression, to be asleep on the job. In some workplaces, falling asleep on the job is considered gross misconduct and grounds for termination of employment. I understand that in Japan, there's a tradition of napping at work, but that's for the sake that workers will stay alert uh, throughout their other hours. In other jobs, the consequences of falling asleep can be disastrous. Um, do you remember in 2008, two pilots fell asleep on their way from Honolulu to Hilo, Hawaii, and they passed their destination, and they had to turn around and come back. Fortunately, they had enough fuel and autopilot. Staying awake at the wheel, at the controls, is often a matter of life or death. Yet the ultimate cost of drowsy discipleship is, at the end of your life, not hearing Jesus' words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, Jesus' disciples soon had an opportunity to practice what Jesus preached. Because in the very next chapter of Mark, Jesus asks His three closest disciples to come with Him to Gethsemane to keep watch while He prayed. Because Jesus' hour, the hour of His trial, of His temptation, the hour where He would have to decide to follow through with His mission to die for the sins of the world, His hour was fast approaching. Do you remember what happened in that story in Mark 14? Jesus goes off to pray. He bears his soul to God. He prays so hard he begins to sweat, and the sweat falls from him like drops of blood. And he comes back, and he discovers the disciples sleeping. He goes off to pray a second time, comes back, and Mark says, he found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. He prays a third time, returns, and guess what? They're sleeping again. These three disciples, Peter, James, and John, are a very sorry support group. We're there for you. Well, not really. Now, there's deep irony here, but Mark knows exactly what he's doing. 
because in between Jesus' teaching, this parable of the absent landlord, in between that parable and the disciples falling asleep when they should have been kept keeping watch, Mark puts in chapter 14 the story of Jesus telling Peter that he would betray him three times before the rooster crows twice. So, do you see what's happening here? Peter's own hour, the hour where his discipleship will be tested, comes when he least expects it. You see, later in the same chapter 14, after Jesus has been arrested, a servant girl accuses Peter of being one of his followers, and Peter denies it. He insists, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And at that moment, I think Peter inadvertently was speaking more truth than he knew, because at that moment, he was not a follower of Jesus. That was his big scene. That was his moment of truth, his hour of decision, and he slept through it. He was not spiritually alert. It was that same night, you see, that he betrayed Jesus earlier on that same night that Jesus, upon finding Peter asleep when Jesus was praying, Jesus said, Simon, Peter's other name, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So, how can we avoid Peter's mistake? We can't do it simply through willpower. Jesus says we have to watch and pray. More to the point, we keep watch by praying. Praying is the best way to attend to God and the things of God. One thing I don't want you to miss, at the very least, this story of the sleepy disciples is powerful evidence about the authenticity of the New Testament accounts. Because wouldn't you expect the people who wrote the Gospels, the disciples, to portray themselves as heroes in the story, but instead, in strikingly honest fashion throughout the Gospels, the disciples are depicted as not really understanding what's going on. It's not a very flattering picture. They fall asleep on their watch, and so they contradict the teaching they just heard. Well, how about us? Are we any more awake or is there a risk that we too are falling asleep at the wheel of our own Christian lives? Coming back to Jesus' story about the absent householder, look at how He concludes verse 37. What I say to you, the original disciples, I say to everyone, and that means us, watch, stay awake. So what are the lessons we can draw from this story? First, true discipleship is about waking up and staying awake to the reality of what God is doing in Christ. God's renewing creation, He's putting the world to rights. So when Jesus urged His disciples to stay alert, He's asking them to be attentive to what God is doing in the world to advance His kingdom and to make sure that they're working with God and not lacking attention. The sad truth is that many of us, many nominal disciples, are only half awake. We may think we're engaged with the real world, but we're actually living in what C.S. Lewis called the Shadowlands. Listen to this letter that Lewis wrote in 1963, just a few months before his own death, to a hospital patient who was worried about her own mortality. Lewis asks her, think of yourself as a seed, patiently waiting in the earth, waiting to come up as a flower in the gardener's good time, waiting to blossom into the real world, the real waking. He goes on, I think our whole present life, looked back on from there, will seem only a drowsy half-waking. We are here in the land of dreams, but the cock crow is coming. Did you get that? Lewis is saying that we're sleepwalking through this life. We may be plugged into social media, but we're not plugged into the only mediator between God and humanity. 
We may be following celebrity Twitter or Instagram accounts, not Paul's epistles and Mark's gospel. I think many of us are suffering from what we could call theological attention deficit disorder, the failure to pay attention to God. Now, it's well documented that attention spans today have suffered because of social media. Marshall McLuhan says that new technologies have a numbing, even narcotic effect that lulls attention. Nicholas Carr in his book, The Shallows, says the internet is by design an interruption system, a machine geared for dividing attention. He says the net seizes our attention only to scatter it. What do you call a pedestrian who walks slowly without being aware of his surroundings because he's talking on a smartphone? The answer is a smombie. It's a real world, a real word, a smartphone zombie. A 2017 psychological review said that smartphone overuse has reached epidemic proportions. Smombie apocalypse, anyone? You see, zombies, and they're all over our culture, by the way. Our culture is fascinated with them. Zombies are the exact opposite of what Jesus wants His disciples to be. But it's appropriate to mention them because they also are linked with the end of the world, and they're prime examples of sleepwalking discipleship. George Romero, the director of the 1968 film, The Night of the Living Dead, views zombies as symbols of mindless consumerism. The main thing they want to consume, you see, is human brains, that is, the center of consciousness, the part of us, of ourselves that pays attention. That's what's being consumed. To be a zombie is to be oblivious to being oblivious. So, the cost of sleepwalking discipleship is that we begin to join the ranks of the living dead. Choose you this day whom you want to be, a member of the waking dead or a wide-awake disciple, a zombie or a Gregory. Our text concludes in verse 37 with Jesus' two-word urgent command, stay awake or watch, watch. And again, He's talking about being spiritually alert so that we'll be ready to play our parts in His story, which is all about the church making disciples of all nations. Waking up and staying awake is the essence of discipleship. How much greater, then, is the failure of those three disciples who couldn't do the one thing Jesus asked, to keep watch? But brothers and sisters, the Christian life is all about the awakening of faith, waking up to what God is doing, and staying awake means being tuned to the truth of the gospel, which is the reality of the human condition. It means not following all those other cleverly devised myths about how to achieve success in this life that so many in our culture are chasing after. The Christian's criterion of sex success is simply this, how well have we kept watch over the doorway to our own souls? Remember, we're all somebody's disciple. We're following somebody's idea about the good life. And the choices we make each day and each hour about what to let in to our minds and hearts, those choices reveal whose words we truly believe and what we truly love. Those choices reveal where our head and our heart truly are. Remember, Jesus also had something to say about love. Do you remember what it was? He said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. And there it is. Friends of Jesus do what He says. His friends are true disciples, and His true friends stay awake. The disciples' duty is to stay spiritually awake, as awake as possible for as long as possible. And all Christians, regardless of their age or generation or denomination, should do this. But how? When I was commuting to and from Wheaton, 
about an hour each way, I was getting drowsy at the wheel. And even those five-hour energy drinks didn't do a thing. <laughs> Physically, being alert begins with a good night's sleep. But spiritual wakefulness is different, and the Apostle Paul has a prescription for how to stay awake. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray continually. Pray continually. To pray is to speak to God, and to speak to God is to be aware of His presence and activity. Prayer is one of the best ways of doing theology. And by theology, I simply mean attending to God and all things in relation to God. To pray is to be reminded to seek first the kingdom of God. You see, true prayer is not about getting my will done in heaven. <laughs> it's about getting God's will done on earth. We need to be alert to that and how to advance that. So prayer is the best way to counter theological attention deficit disorder. Well, we end where we began with Jesus' statement, no one knows that hour, the hour of His return. Albert Camus, the French existentialist writer, was not a Christian, but he did have an eschatology. In his novel, The Fall, one of the characters says, you don't have to wait for the last judgment. It takes place every day. I think the Gospel of Mark agrees. No one knows the hour of Jesus' return, but we should all be ready for it, for we don't want to be caught sleeping. Let's learn from Peter's bad example. Every moment has the potential to become that hour, that moment of decision, that moment of testing to see whether we are indeed awake to Jesus' Lordship or simply sleepwalking our way through life. Jesus was ready for His hour in Gethsemane. Peter was not. What about us? The words Jesus is asking us to follow are simply these. Be alert everywhere and at all times for that hour, that moment that tests and hopefully proves our discipleship. The church exists to make disciples people who are wide awake to the new reality in Christ that is dawning, people who are watching and waiting for every opportunity to bear true witness to that new reality and their Lord, people who are ready for that hour. Can I get a witness? Or better, can I get a Gregory? Stay awake because you do not know when the owner of the house is coming back. Let us pray. Lord, we confess that in and of ourselves we can do nothing to please You without You in our lives. But we thank You for the promise that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Wake us up to life in Christ and through Your Spirit, keep us awake to the things that really matter. And now as we prepare to follow Jesus' words, to remember His death by sharing His table. We ask that You would indeed strengthen us for a lifetime of discipleship as we feed on Christ in faith. We ask this in His precious name. Amen.